welcome. You're listening to Access to Perspectives Conversation. Today with me here in the Zoom room is Ludmila Figueredo. We met a couple of years ago um, through the um, Open Science Fellowship Program by Wikimedia Germany, where I had the pleasure of working with you, Ludmila. And I'm very glad you're joining us today for this podcast. Welcome very much. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's a pleasure. <laughs> So um, uh, for the preparation also, like we've, you've done a lot of work um, or we've worked together also in, in open science and open science um, realm where you, during the Wikimedia Fellowship, you worked on a project um, developing an electronic lab notebook mm -hmm. um, that's really simple to use or a simple in structure for easy, um, adaptability so we come to talk about that um, you have a background in um, ecosystem conservation broadly oh, yeah, yeah broadly uh, more ecological modeling and ecological theory yes yeah. with views to conservation yeah so basically uh, your research informs ecosystem conservation could we say that yeah, you could say yes. It's it, because I, I I used to work with um, extinction. So what I do is to try and understand when and how they go extinct, right? Mm. But to be fair, I have actually changed jobs recently and become much more involved with open science practices and helping researchers. So it's really fitting to my to my Wikimedia project, which is like great and also funny how fitting it is great yeah no that's it's funny to see how careers sometimes unfold just through a fellowship or a project opportunity that you yeah. um, dare to tap into and then a whole new career path opens up afterwards so would you would you guide us through some of your career steps and the the turning points or where, like what your research interest is um, from your undergraduate studies and what led you then to ecosystem modeling um, towards open science and open science practices and what you're now yeah. working on. Sure, so I've always wanted to study biology. I was always um, concerned about environmental question, uh, questions and conservation and, and so on and this type of um, issues that we have ever since I was a kid, to be honest. So I study, studying biology was pretty much um, uh, no brainer for me. I was decided much before we had to make a choice. And in this, in, in my uh, uh, biology undergrad studies, I specialized in ecology, right? But I honestly, I always find, found ecology a bit hard because it's very, um, it's sometimes it can be presented very case by case until I was introduced to ecological models, which basically summarize the big ideas and show you the, the, the main, I mean, it's a model for a reason, right? They summarize um, the main processes, the main patterns that we can see. So this is what got me completely hooked on ecological modeling. And also I liked a bit of mathematics, so it made it, made it easier for me. So from then on, um, during my undergraduate, we had an exchange program from the university for um, where you could get a scholarship to go study abroad. And through this, I went to France. And also by chance, I, I always say that I'm sometimes I'm very lucky that they were just starting a master's degree there in ecological modeling. So a specialized master's degree. And because of the way um, the, the Brazilian and the, so I'm Brazilian, the Brazilian and the French curriculum works, I was able to start this master's program. And then I finished it up. So I had a master's in ecological um, modeling, very specialized. And this was what, seven years ago when the, the use of models were, was like a big thing in ecology. I mean, it has always been important, but it has seen a, significant rise uh, in the last 10 years or so and so after the, the masters I was I was looking for PhD projects and I found this one in Wurzburg it was around ecosystem debts oh, sorry extinction debts which is um, um, uh, extinctions that happen late after some disturbances so you can think of a 
some forest being uh, thrown, uh, being uh, cut down for either some construction work or for wood or something like this. And then you have the, you, what happens often is that the species, the birds and the mem mammals or even the plants, they're not immediately affected. Okay, you have some that die, but the whole species or the whole population that lived in that area and around that area is going to suffer for many years before it eventually comes extinct or in some cases not, but it's this delayed effect that you can have. And because it can last several dozens of years, um, the, the, the idea of the project was to build a model to simulate it. And this is where my, my interest in documenting my work started to be not I, I I did it's not only it was not, not it was not only about me wanting to do it, it was more that I realized okay I have to do it because it's when you build such models you have to combine what you know from theory, what you know from observation into you you you, you take pieces from different parts. And this means that you have to say, okay, this is coming from this, and this is why I think the for example, if I'm trying to simulate um so how uh, plants reproduce and live through their life cycle or something. I have to justify how I think they will, how many seeds they will produce per year, how much they will grow and so on. And with the model that we were building, it was quite complex. So we were, we, were, we wanted to simulate a lot of uh, ecological dynamics, we would say. So this means um, competition between species, reproduction, growth, and so on. So you have to justify it because when people, they read it, the, the, either reviewers or my, my, my peers, they have to know, okay, I'm not just doing this because I want this to work. I want this to, to simulate something. I, I need to, to show that it's um, um, justified by, by theory, by ob previous observations, right? And so this started mostly as, a, as something for me. So and it was very much focused on documentation. But then, um, honestly, it was also a way for me to combat a bit of imposter syndrome because I was like, okay, I'm not completely sure I'm doing here sometimes and what if it's wrong or not? And I just realized, okay, if I write down and I give it to people, to my supervisors, to reviewers, they'll be able to see if there's something wrong and then they'll tell me. And then there's no, not, not, not this fear anymore, right? I, I'll just know what is wrong. And also, I was at the time I was um, I worked for the department, the zoology, the zoology department at the University of Wurzburg, the Zoology Three, but also at the Center for Computational and Theoretical Biology. And there, it's a very much like a very computationally savvy crowd, which I was not at all in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I was coming across all these software development tools and practices, and um, they have a lot going for the documentation and the project management part. And I was, um, I was trying to combine these because some of them were very useful, right? To keep track of your work and so on. And I just started to incorporate some practices into my own um, project management um, that I did for myself. And at some point actually discussing with them because they're always promoting the seminars where we talk about our, how to make our work better or how to work some new tools that make our life easier, I realized that I was, I had actually had quite a good system. I mean, I was one, I was actively trying to improve it. And so I presented the idea to them and I saw that it was something that they were interested in. And then I kept developing it. And then at some point from the University of Wurzburg, the graduate school, I saw the announcement for the, for the Wikimedia project. And, uh, and this was the, 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 the idea, right? Okay, we'll fund you so you can um, work on a, a, a project that fosters some um, aspect of um, open science. And I thought that maybe because I was at the end of my PhD and I wasn't sure where um, I would get funding further. So, okay, this sounds like a good way of assigning some hours to wrap up my ideas around this project and make it something that others can use instead of just a tool that I myself use and then I have to maybe sit down with someone for two hours to explain it to them. Mm -hmm. And this is how it came to be. And through the project, then I, I learned how, how much open science practices make sense, like 
the saying goes like open science is just science done right. So, and I, I learned about other aspects of open science that were quite important for me because I, I was, I saw that I was getting very um, cornered into this very academic side of our work, which is producing research for our peers. And that was getting a bit, um, the, my world was closing in a bit. And I just, um, so the, the, the open science movement o opened up my eyes for these other ways where we can make our research a bit more approachable, maybe not directly as science communication, but just for pe people a little bit outside our, of our fields, because this is something that happens as well in ecological modeling. If you, if you, if I, I would often sit down with my more empirical colleagues and they would be like, I don't understand anything you say. And I said, this is not, this is not good. It doesn't mean that what we do is super hard. It just means that we're not communicating well. So this was, mm -hmm. was stuff that started to come to become more and more obvious for me. And it was, again, it, I would see this documentation practices as a way of um, bridging, you know, the, 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 these two um, areas, the empirical and the, uh, and the modeling um, side, of it, uh, side of it. And so, in the, and then, so I was working, I, I kept this practice for myself. I, I worked in the, in, the, in the project during our mentoring and um, wrote a paper on it. It's 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 under review. It should come out soon. And actually, by chance, again, uh, some six months ago or so, I saw this um, announcement for a for a work as a data and code curator at the mm -hmm. German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, the IDIV, here in Leipzig. It's a um, it's an institution that is um, a combination of efforts from Halle, Jena, and Leipzig. And I, it was, it fitted perfectly, honestly, with my interests, interests, my, the kind of work that I, that I think I'm good at. So it, as much as I, I, I loved research, I, I, I really think, I, I honestly think I'm good at the, this part of the curation and sitting down with the researchers and explaining why this is important and showing how to do it. And I mean, with the work that I did at Wikimedia, this was um, this this part of explaining it to people and making it easier for them. Also, um, I got to to work on it as I as I presented my ideas to other people and discussed it with colleagues. And so, um, yeah. So then I, I I applied, got the job. It started uh, two months ago. And we are, um, I'm still learning a little bit, right? The inter, in, a, in the workings of the, of IDIV and so on. But what I'm really happy um, about this position is that they have um, this dedicated position to support the researchers. Because mm -hmm. this was also an idea that came, that became clear in my project was that it, it can feel like ex asking people to do more work which is already for a researcher is a lot, especially younger researchers who are the ones who are going to have to do these practices for, who are going to have to have data management plans for their grants. It's, it's going to be, uh, it, it can feel like a lot more work, especially if we think of a very, um, if we come across, if you're not so knowledgeable in the, in the, in the digital documentation parts and you don't have, you still have to establish your workflow, which was a, what I did during my PhD, but I mean, I had kind of the time to do it, but it, it, it became important to me to show, okay, it is a little bit more work initially, but it pays off eventually because one, you get the documentation that you will need to publish something mm -hmm. good. And also it's actually something that came across um, in the reviewers process for, for our paper is that it saves time for the researchers themselves. When they go back into, the, into some work, they're able to catch up much easier, or if they have to pass it on to some colleague that is taking over the project, someone, is come, someone new is coming, it's much easier to pass it on if you can just, okay, read this, and then we go through your questions, rather, okay, let's schedule a meeting, and then I have to go through all of this with you. You have to write it yourself. So it was, a, I, I'm really, really happy with the combination of things that got me here and um, that I'm very, um, I'm always excited to work on it. 
when I yeah. see that I get to do it as a job, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. So, um, so you focus on conservation biology and you support researchers who have a research focus on that discipline or research topic in particular. So not so much conservation biology. The, the idea is very open for biodiversity research. So we have the, mm -hmm. the conservation um, groups. We have the people working on biodiversity and economics. We have the people working on biological interactions, which is would be something um, you could say like um, blue sky research, more or less, always with the idea of how can we use it for conservation, but mm -hmm. not only, you know, the, you, the, this idea of having it integrative is this, that you have, you allow people, you allow work groups to work on, on their own research areas, and then the integrative parts come and then they can apply it to conservation or to um, science communication or to um, human well-being. And my work actually is really on supporting all of them, all of these groups. So I don't do uh, much uh, research. I don't do research anymore it's except for finishing up papers that I still have been uh, revealed or mm -hmm. finalized. My work is really concentrated on whenever they have data that they want to publish. So the ID has, a, has its own um, data portal where the... the the, the workers and the PhD students are asked to publish their data in their code as well. They come to us and they say, okay, I, I, I know what I'm doing. I, can, I just want to publish. So I'll just do a basic curation job. I'll just see, okay, it conforms to our standards. This and that is more or less understandable. And um, so we just, um, and then I, I, I just need to say, okay, check i give them a doi and they can go on about their lives but it can also be the case that they come with us so okay i have no idea what is happening please help me document this code or please um i need to publish this my 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 the journal asks for it what do i do and we we support them um along the way and also eventually we start giving a bit more courses and workshops with this idea of um, open science practices and good scientific practices um, um, for the PhDs and even the, the, the more um, senior um, researchers. So it's really a dedicated work, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting that you're able to work on intersection between the different research topics or rotating around biodiversity. <laughs> some explorative like basic research trying to understand ecosystems of different kinds some more applied research or conservation oriented and then how it all feeds into a bigger picture of understanding ecosystems is it is there a regional focus on germany on like any particular ecosystems region wise oh, it's or? very very international so they have projects that are very particular that are specific to germany so some citizen science projects i'm even mm -hmm. participating i have a bee hotel here in my my balcony where i'm getting some sampling some bees for them but there is all kinds of ger of projects they have um ecological stations um in other cities and they have co um, corporations with other uh, countries so it's it's really it really depends on the group and mm -hmm. on the interest yeah so do you also help them with the fair principles how to make their yeah. research data fair um and yeah, so I'm actually... yeah go on uh, so i'm asking because i had a i was like we had a recent um, episode on this podcast with Danny Winston, where we also talked in um, a lot about fair principles and how it sounds so easy and nice, and yes, let's all do it in theory, but then when it comes to mm -hmm. how is it actually being done and where are the examples that we can take as an example to organize our own research data? And then I tend to say, well, sorry, but it's normally quite, not even discipline, but also research topic specific. So every research project needs its own data management plan and every um, data point, every metadata point needs its own assessment for how it mm -hmm. can become fair. But then, of course, also the fair principles give some general guideline. Um, so that's one question. So how, 
how is it in your day-to-day -day life like how how do you manage to um, inform researchers from all these different disciplines within biodiversity um the the broader topic but still each of the research groups working on very distinct and specific research topics what's the common denominators is there a pattern that you discover well it's only two months into working there but how, how easy or difficult do you find helping them in implementing the fair principles um, actually, so this, um, I, I, I'm actually hired by the University of Vienna, so by the fusion group at the informatics department, led by Professor uh, Birgit Konigris, and they are, they are working on, on, a, on, on building the structure to allow the application of fair principles for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting, um, I'm getting on, on a very well established, um, I would say structure. To, to support us. So we have constant meetings, we have constant um, inter interchange of uh, knowledge. And so with that in mind, I would say I have a solid stru a structure, a structure from where to work. And in terms of applying it, I also have to acknowledge the work that was done by my, my colleague, the, uh, the data steward at IDIV, so Dr. Anahita Kazem. She has been working for a year and a half in this new data code unit. So they had already, they have restructured the, the, the this dedicated data and code unit to what was again to support the, the, the publication and documentation of code at the IDIV. Um, and then this, the, the work that she has been doing has been mostly on, um, it's a lot of training, so uh, simply quote unquote uh, workshops to inform the, the researchers about the importance of, of the fair principles, what they are. And I would say more, even more specifically, I would um, say that the work that we do with the develop, developers of the fusion group, so the, the group at Vienna, where they are um, working on making our data databases um, more accessible, I would say, mostly, and interoperable with other um, databases out there. So, and our job in the, this sense is bring the, from one sense, okay, what are the, the the databases we need to communicate on, what are the bigger, um, for example, repository uh, platforms that we need to be findable at, something like this, and get this to the developers and also go to the, to the, to the researchers and say, okay, we really need this field because let's say a user comes through the portal and wants to search for this or that, this or that type of data, we need them to be to be fi to to find it. They might not know your research in detail. They might come with a blank mind and and not um, know exactly what to to look for. So, in summary, I would say this is how we do it. We have a very solid base for matter to work, and then we work more on the on t training, especially the young researchers, right? And but also justifying very well, showing how important it is, um, how uh, how this pays off in in the end to have this this um, work available and fair, and how it reflects in the advancement of science and the advancement of knowledge and um, cooperation. And ultimately, if they want to be very uh, selfish, quote unquote, in funding, even if you if you don't convince them by the the fair of it, you convince them by, by fun, yeah. Mm. So maybe you should also mention here for the listeners who are not it familiar with the FAIR principles, just to um, explain the acronym, um, F-A-I-R stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for data items to be, um, mm -hmm. which is not to be confused necessarily with open. That can be that FAIR data is open but it doesn't have to be and this is a common misconception or misassumption um, when it comes to conservation biology and biodiversity um, or in particular in the re with the research groups that you're working with is there 
is there data that should not be publicly available, like sensitive data that yeah. some of the research groups work with, and what would that be? Yes, you can have, so you can have data from, um, so you could think of camera traps, which are basically camera, small cameras that you put in the middle of a forest somewhere and they activate by movement and then they can capture the, the, the animal that is coming through. And so, for example, you would say, okay, I, I did this study in a forest in Madagascar. I had 20 camera traps um, set up, but I'm not going to review their location because it's sensitive. Because if, I, if one of these camera traps captures some very rare um, species of lemur or some other mammal that is um, endangered, you don't want to be revealing the, their locations. Um, and helping few people find it, you know. So this would be the type of um, of sensitive information that we don't need to to to, um, to make public, and it doesn't um, affect the the end result of the mm -hmm. um, of the work. You know, if people want to reuse it, they'll be able to. They they don't need to, and they can they, they can always ask the the co-authors if they absolutely need it, and then there is an agreement and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the 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 work is still accessible. It's still findable, and it's still reusable. It's just that some there is this this small um, detail that we can we have to work on. And this is the type of um, uh, the type of work that we do in curation, right? Where we we we. We, they say, okay, I cannot show this. We're okay, all right. We just inform this in the documentation, make it clear and so on. So this is totally possible. And yeah, this can definitely happen. Yeah, so it's basically to protect the animal or the plant species from illegal hunting or, um, yeah, being- yeah. yeah, or even like curious people for some reason, Tourism really want to see that species. Though they are, we know that they are in this very small patch of forest. No, we don't. We don't want it. so. And it's it, it, it and it's a nice thing for the researchers to know that they can still make their data available for others without endangering their objects of study. Because in this, especially in these cases, the 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 animals. It, it, it's almost a, like a. A hard thing, you know. It's it's a love thing. So the research is very precious about their mm. their species, and we want to 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 protect it as well. Yeah, um, there's the re3data.org, um, the Registry of Research Data Repositories. Are your data repositories also um, linked there already, or not yet, or for a reason maybe not? Um. That's a good question. I think it should be. Yeah, it, we are... it sounds like it might be in it. I'm just asking because in some cases, I assume there's also reasons for keeping certain data sets separate for mm -hmm. organizational, political, whatever reasons. Um, the the re 3 data registry is um, an attempt to centralize or right, actually have like mm -hmm. this central registry with global research data repositories represented. Um, yeah, um, and it's work in progress. So that's basically just for the listeners, maybe also a, a source to check out if you're working with research data or you're interested in exploring research data. You can search this registry by discipline, research topic, region, and then you find um, research data across also regions, yeah. disciplines, and research topics. Mm -hmm. um, but this, so this is something that with the with the the IDIF data portal, we have different data sets, right? And mm -hmm. the data sets they they can be made um, open or not. Depending on, for example, the, the researcher wants to do an embargo until they want to finish publishing, analyzing everything they want to do. So it might be the case that some of our data are not um, available yet, but yeah. we keep it, we keep an eye out for it. Okay, why is it embargoed? We want an extension or something, and so th this might be the case where it, it, it won't be open. Mm -hmm. And it's made case by case. So this is also part of the curation job where the researcher says, okay, I need to 
to to I, I, I don't want to publish yet. I want to to document it right and deposit it, but not don't make it open yet, please. And then we we take care of it. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's also an important aspect because some open science enthusiasts they call for oh let's be as open as we can be. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's also a level of re responsibility and accountability and cleaning up data sets is a lot of work and takes quite a bit of time. So as much as we want to be open about sharing data and research results, there's also this responsibility component where we need to make sure that the, the results that we publish as researchers is actually fair, not only for the data, but also into, like to be interpreted by the researchers and contextualized mm -hmm. um, yeah. properly. So yeah, so just to, to have a shout out also for understanding why some research projects mix, might take some time to before yeah. they have their results or make them openly accessible and searchable online. But the idea with FAIR is to be FAIR also for our own sake. Like many PhD students, including myself, know very well mm -hmm. what it means to, to find yourself towards the end of your PhD, having to write up your, like, your thesis, and then going through your lab notebook, which brings us yeah. to another topic <laughs> we came mm -hmm. here to talk about. Um, and I think this is what electronic lab notebooks can help us tremendously in avoiding the stress and the despair that some of us has, have experienced um, throughout the PhD and especially towards the end. By, yeah. yeah, from the start of your PhD or any research project, we really to have a system that makes it easy to capture your results, to document, mm -hmm. to contextualize on the go, and then to have easy access through digital workflows um, towards the end of the PhD or the towards the end of a research project when you want to write it up, publish the data sets along with a manuscript. Um, so what what was it that brought you to to conceptualize the project that you presented at the Wikimedia Open Science Fellowship Program to build an electronic lab notebook? Why like I think you mentioned in the beginning to like to our conversation here that you found a need based on your personal experience for that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Just explore a little bit more. Yeah. So it was. I think it was a combination. So it was. I had a lot in the, from the very beginning. I had a lot to make sense of because. So the 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 idea behind these ecological models, especially if they are big and complex and is that you're going to combine different ideas from different theories in different areas. So I had to organize my thinking around uh, this. And this meant reading loads of articles and making notes and learning German in the evenings. So at the, <laughs> at the if I left something for two weeks, when I came back to it, it would be really hard to get back into. And all, or I would read something and have no idea where I read it. I just remember a term or a word. And then I would be able to, for example, search for it somewhere in my computer, you know? So it, it was a mix of, okay, let's have, I need to have a place where I can put my thoughts down and I need to be able to search uh, through them very easily. So I would say that th those are the main motivators which is why I switched from a, a, a written notes, which was what I had, and I still have like two full stocks of paper uh, on it to a, an electronic system. And I, I still use it to this day, and I use a, a much more complicated system actually than the one I present. Um, and I kept working on it. Um, so with this idea of, okay, I need to write down my thoughts, I need to, to be able to search through them. And as I would have meetings with my supervisors, this is where the need to be able to communicate it and to justify myself started to be stronger. And so, and I would, this also would mean that I would have to go back to documentation and show, okay, I got this from this and that paper. And this was my reasoning around it because it's not only the, 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 the reference, right? You have to, to be able to explain it. And to be honest, my memory is not that great. So sometimes it's, simply forget things and so to be to have um, descriptive and well uh, written notes is very important in that sense 
And finally was seeing, uh, getting so caught up in this system that I actually had a very complicated system. So it got very overcomplicated and uh, that was a lot of work. And as much as, I mean, as boring as it sounds, I kind of like doing it for some reason, but at the same time is what it was eating my time, right? So I, I, I went back into uh, trying to simplify it. And this is where the discussions with people at the, at the CCTB in Wattbock, the Center for Computational and Theoretical Biology, this is where it became important to me to show them, okay, this is what I'm doing. Are you guys doing something different? Is there, are there any steps I could cut? And um, uh, discussing with my colleagues also in the eco ecosystem modeling group uh, there, because we are always, we are all interested in it. So we, you can think of a bunch of nerds talking about tools so we can get far, but all, and also doing a, like you said, it's, it's doing a proper job, doing a good job of communicating our work, which again, as I said before, in ecological modeling, it's very important to come across, show it that it's, it's not just a bunch of equations that we put together. You can actually understand it. And it's important because if you think that we are talking about um, extinctions, it is going to eventually affect um, conservation of species. It, 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 is, it has the potential to affect policy. So we have to be able to justify it for our peers. So in the immediate effect, I would say, but also for um, stakeholders and whoever is involved in transporting it into action, right? And this is where the, the good documentation makes it easier. Okay, uh, someone might not read the, the, the manual of our model, but it, it can be translated in a, in a more sim, um, simplified language. And for that, you need the, a good documentation. It, you need to show that it's based on reality. It's not like coming out of my mind and creating a, a fantasy world, you know? And so this is, so you could, say, you could think of these three main phases of, okay, I need something that is um, searchable and, can retain my thoughts, then I need something that my supervisors can understand. And then I, I needed to make it simpler so that I could do it properly and not waste so much time on it. And through this whole time, I had the support, as I said, from my colleagues at the CCTB. Um, shout out to Giuliano, Giuliano Sameto Cabral, my, my, my supervisor, one of my supervisors during that time who, is always, who always encouraged this type of exploration and allowed us to discuss it so much. Um, and this is what was a refinement. And by the time I came to the Wikimedia project, I also got very nice uh, reviews from the from my application, which what was a main point that I was kind of aware, but I wasn't sure how to do with it. Was that okay? There are quite a few resources online already. If you look for how to organize your work in R, which is the soft programming languages. Uh, pro programming language most ecologists or biologists use, that you will find different um, posts online, different videos. And this was something that was said, okay, this work needs to show how it's going to be different from all these other that exists. And this is where it also contributed to, to this idea of mine to make it very simple because from these tutorials, I would often see that they require the, the, the researcher to have some background in either computational uh, science or be quite digital, uh, computationally savvy. And it's not always the case. And as I said, I don't want to add too much work to people's, um, to people's workload already, right? So this, this, is, this is the part that probably took the most time for me was to organize the work and not only the workflow that I propose, so the way that I propose people do it, but also the language and the, even the figures or the type of tools that I, that I use to make it very simple for someone to catch up uh, and start using it very um, fast and not to have to do a lot of maintenance work, which was what, uh, what I said before. And yet for it to be effective, right? Because, okay, I have something simple, but it doesn't quite get there. This, this is not what I was going for. So mm -hmm. finding this balance took, took, a, took me some time, 
but in the end, I'm, I'm quite happy with the results. So yeah, if I had to summarize was, would be like, okay, let, let's get the very minimal that you need to know yourself what you're doing, tell others what you're doing and don't waste too much time um, producing it, I would say. And then also reproducing it when you try to understand your yeah, own yeah, yeah, exactly. but yeah, yeah. In, a, in a structured form, like in an ELN, an electronic lab notebook, you, you can track your own research documentation more easily. Yeah. So, so you you summarize the project. It's it's available on GitHub, the, yes. the lab notebook itself. And um, you also summarize it in a in a manuscript published as a yeah. preprint. Yeah. Right. So it's not as a preprint yet, but it's 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 coming soon because we I haven't found a preprint that takes tools and 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 such type of papers, right? It's not like it's not new research. So the, the, the preprint that I the preprint servers that I tried to put it on, they were like, yeah, we would like to have new research um, oh, really? available. Yeah. Oh, that's that's so discouraging to hear because normally preprint servers are meant to yeah, to 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 not have bottlenecks of that sort. But you yeah. could just, for example, register Zenodo and put it there. Zenodo doesn't have any constraints. Yeah. So yeah. And, yeah, but the, the, the yes, I, I I can try it because this is the thing. The, this were the preprint service that I I looked into, but it might be the case that um, I put it on on Zenora, as you said. But it's it's it it I, I I see. I think it's on a good track to be published soon. And in any case, the the GitHub page has um, everything um, there. Yeah. A, a quite good summary, I would say. And this was also something that I became important was that I have video tutorials that walk you through the work because some stuff is is easier shown than the, I can I can talk about it as much as I want if you don't see it getting done it's it might be a bit hard to imagine how it works so the the video tutorials I, I think are, are good um, are one of the main resources that I have in there yeah I, I have to admit I haven't followed up since since you um, published those so <laughs> maybe we can also if, since it's open we can also put it on on the access to perspectives website as yeah. a word resource and yeah just have the dissemination have you heard of people adopting your your like yeah, actually, yes so i presented it to my um to the um, people at the center for computational the cctb it's mm -hmm. um Workbook, and actually, I heard from some people that they are using it. I also found some links to it in some um, at the Fair Points organization, so the the event series that they have. I the other day I was just going through the material, and I saw oh, my stuff is in there, though that was nice. <laughs> and so it's it, and whenever I talk to people, they always say, "Oh, please let me check it because I think I will start using it." I also had people from the zoology three department telling me, um, okay, this sounds doable. I can, I can use it because this, this was something that I made sure to, to go, okay, let's get the more empirical crowd to test it and see mm -hmm. if they, if they would actually adopt it. And um, yeah, so I'm, it, I, I think it has a good track. Nice. And is it targeted at biosciences or can it be adopted by any discipline potentially? Or what are the um, topics that limited or specified for bioscience? Not really. Um, I think as long this is actually something also that came into the review process, and I was happy that the reviewer said, "I don't know why you're." I initially targeted at ecology, um, ecological research, because this is the examples that I have. But what they said was like, "I don't know why to, why you're targeting it." I think many people from um, would benefit from it. So I would say that as long as you have some part of your work that is, uh, I mean, all work is documented, but if you have computational work that you need to write down as a script form and that you have results that you can show and um, preferably uh, data that you can store somewhere, you can use it. So it's very generic. The, the, as I said, the, the, the examples that I give 
um, because in the in the in the in the repository you see that I have um, some examples of okay what would the final product look like. I use um, examples from ecology, but as long as you have some work that is um, that has a part of computational work that you need to explain your thinking that you. You, you could use it because the basic idea is having this document where you have the, the narrative text where you explain your reasoning, you have the code that you where you actually apply it, so to say, and then you have some graphs, if it makes sense, where you show the results of your of your computational work and also some discussion there, discussion in there if it makes sense. So in this sense, as long as this is um, the case for your work, I would say it's it's useful, it's stressful. Yeah, great. I, I also vividly remember um, our conceptualization discussions and how I presented. Like, it sounded exciting and, and highly useful since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's really great to hear how it's now being adopted and used by an increasing number of researchers. But, um, oh, yeah. I'll do my part and maybe also through the sport cards podcast, some, some more people will be able to find it. So we will put the link to your um github repository describing it mm -hmm. into the show notes or into the blog posts affiliated yep. to the episode um yeah so for some concluding remarks so um mm -hmm. thanks for sharing with us your journey through conservation biology biodiversity um uh yeah <laughs> data um analysis uh research um, modeling, modeling. <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> sitting on the word. Um, and yeah, it's 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 quite a journey, and it's yeah, it's it's captivating how passionate you are about um, each each step in that journey, and how it's still it's still on each of the topics, and everything um, appears to make a lot of sense um, on how you position yourself also with your career. What were like maybe two or three or just one major recommendation be to the listeners from your experience and and the, like when they hear about open science when they hear about data management or open data fair data is there something you like from the experience of your consultation and the, the support you give to the researchers at the institute um, what are the major challenges and how would you encourage people to, to overcome these and to just dig in? And... Um, I would say, so the, the, something that I heard a couple of times already was, um, I'm afraid to publish my code and see what people will do, which is something that comes around, and, but I got to hear it like personally. So don't be afraid of it. The community is usually very open to share and improve if there is something that urgently needs fixing. So people are usually um, um, friendly about it, I would say. So don't be afraid to publish your code, to have people talk about it. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, you, you, it, it is good if you explain yourself, but um, start slow would be the second. So the first one, don't be afraid, put it out there. The, the second one is, as I said, start slow. Don't try to, to go with um, the most pristine routine. It might take some adjustments, um, but it's better getting start to get it done than not to do it at all, which was also something that I did. I started, I, I, it took me some years to uh, refine my process, but I eventually found it and hopefully the the, the work that I put out, the, the kit is, helps some people along this way. And um, finally, um, making your research, I mean, th this fear has been decreasing, especially because there has been a lot of um, communication about the, about the fact that, okay, getting a, your, getting a data citation, getting, a data that you produced cited is also uh, being recognized more and more. So it doesn't mean that your work is going to get robbed at, or that you're missing opportunities. You know, you can, you have the flexibility of saying, okay, this is some work that I really want to do it myself. So I will hold on this data for some time. 
but eventually put it out there so that others can use because um, you will get the, the recognition for it and in, 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 a, in a bigger um, sense, in a more um, altruistic sense, I guess, you would be contributing to, 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 um, to science in general. And um, if you are working on biodiversity research, I, I see, I think that especially in biodiversity research, all of us can see how important it is to have this common efforts. We don't have the time for people to be, okay, I want to save everything myself. It's not going to work. We need collaboration. We need to, to help each other and share tests because this is the only way we can, we can make a, the impact that we need um, in this sense. So to summarize would be, don't be afraid. People are not that bad. And worst case scenario, you learn some, something from the critiques. Um, start slow, but start and don't be afraid to be scoped or anything. It's, mm -hmm. you, you still have the flexibility to, to, to have your passion projects um, stored for you, so to say. Yeah, also like with the scooping, that's actually the opposite. You can protect your work and uh, yeah, the, your ideas by signing, having your eyes assigned to any documentation mm -hmm. you put online so um that it's citable and yeah people will acknowledge your contribution and maybe one last word because i also felt it during my phd um when it comes to i think what's commonly referred to as the imposter syndrome when you work on a research project that has a potentially huge impact and um many of us researchers start our careers with a purpose in mind or we want to contribute to something bigger we want to save the world or find a treatment for a disease or rescue an animal species from extinction or and many also just want to do research for research sake just to explore because we're curious and that's just as valid as a as a driver for being a researcher in the first place but now when it comes to opening up to share our results i also felt like this is so little who would who would potentially be able to benefit from me sharing this and this is even good enough so what made you or was there a point where you realized well yes of course it's good enough and everybody's contributing a little piece to the bigger puzzle and like i think you explained it beautifully like through the exchange of putting our cards on the table basically online yeah. or in also in some cases closed research networks and digital infrastructures that are not open to the public because there might be sensitive mm -hmm. data involved. Um, but then you have the opportunity to collect feedback and input and information that will further inform your research. Yeah, basically, I also already gave my hat <laughs> to the to my own question, but would you, would you agree with that? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, I actually need to make a small note because I came across it a couple of weeks ago that this idea of imposter syndrome might even be a bit debatable in the sense that the origins of the term, I mean, I can, I can share you the, where I read it because I, I, I'm not into psychology that much, but the origins of this term, they put a lot of, of weight on the person themselves when it might actually be also a result of the environment that, where they are. So I'll give you an example. So I grew up not that, uh, despite my age, I wasn't, uh, I did not have like a functioning uh, computer and internet at home until I was uh, late in my almost 20. So I, 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 this computational part of work came through me quite late if I would compare it to some of my colleagues. So when I arrived in that setting, it was, I was, oh my God, I'm so behind. What am I doing here? And I don't know half of the things that these people know. And you can think of um, even um, less privileged people that they might end up in, in research positions that are, they are, they are waiting, you could, I mean, quote unquote, they are going over their heads, but the, 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 they, are, they, are, they are, it's not like they are imposters. It's just that they are trying something that it's completely new and that they were not prepared for. And this might generate this feeling of inadequacy that it's mm -hmm. not their fault. So this is something that I need to acknowledge here because I, I learned from it um, recently and I think it makes sense. 
But coming back to whatever is the, the origin of this inadequacy, like you said, I think this 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 um, sentence that you said, it's like putting your hearts on the table is is the most important because as I said, if it's, if not only you will most likely find people that are actually inter interested in it, whatever is the topic, like you said, if it's something that is totally relevant and it's totally urgent problem or it's blue sky research, like completely out there question that you have, it's most likely that you will, you will hear from someone that um, appreciates it and is, it, is, in, is interested in it rather than someone um, degrading it or downplaying it. And also, as I said, um, like do it, go and, and, and do it and like get it wrong and someone will fix you and then you'll learn something from it because it's better than being in that fear state um, mm -hmm. of, you know, ah, is it good enough? Is it not? Is it relevant? Is it, isn't it? You have to talk to other people, you know, you and your, yourself and your supervisors can only do so much. And as long as you, as, 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 um, as early as you start opening up, you see that you have the, the positive feedback. If not uh, from your immediate circle, then it even shows the, the bigger necessity of it op opening it. So you have even more input and eventually you get new ideas and so on. So it's, it's this idea of, okay, go out there. If it's good, great. If it's bad, you have learned something from it. Yeah. Yeah. And it will even pave your career like it did for you. Like <laughs> yeah. Then seeing a position, oh, that sounds interesting. It has not much, but I can make my research fit into this program. And uh, the call is not specific to my research, but, and then next, not two years later, you have a paid position to yeah to further inform research to support researchers doing better research and having better outcomes of the research altogether and eventually that has a positive impact on conservation biology yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. this is the this is the thing the, and this is the, the, the idea that uh, as i said the, at this discussions at the system were important because of this because i realized that it was a common need that people were working on themselves, but as soon as we started sharing, we, we had something um, bigger and more useful to, to, to apply, to, to improve, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Ludmilla, for joining Thank us you. today. And I'm really excited on, yeah, stay in touch, um, hearing again from you or having other conversations in the future and how to bring your lab notebook to more people out there. And also to yeah for you to facilitate um, the researchers at the institute and and the and the broader uh, research network to yeah to do fair data management properly and yeah and we can all learn from each of these examples all together. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Mm -hmm.